Welcome back to your legislation. Great for you to come back in again, Randy. Thank you, Debbie, for having me. It's wonderful. I appreciate it. And I look forward to it. Oh, I, well, that's good because they do too. We get phone calls and good. people telling us that they didn't realize this is how it works. Well, so I'm glad that people like it. I'm glad we're able to keep them informed about what's going on in Indiana. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, it, we'll see how much we can get them to learn. <laughs> So now, where are you at in session right now? Well, that's a great question, Debbie. And I, sometimes uh, we're so busy, I wonder that myself. Um, on Tuesday of last week, this past week, was the last day for House bills in the Senate, Senate bills in the House, or what we know as the end of the second half. And so from now through next Thursday, uh, we're in what we call conference committee. And that's where uh, the bill versions from the House and the Senate have to be reconciled uh, before they can go to the governor for a signature. And so uh, there's a lot of activity. Uh, bills are in conference committee. And by the way, a conference committee is a committee, but it's different than what we have during the first and second half. The conference committee is almost always chaired by the author of the bill. Uh, and then conferees, as they're called, are appointed by both the Senate and the House to be the conferee on the bill. And that's where you go to a, a committee, you hear the ideas, uh, maybe the House's version, maybe the Senate's version, and then you decide, okay, this is what we believe is good public policy. You have a, what's called a conference committee report. That report is drafted and then has to be signed by the House and uh, Republicans and Democrats and the Senate Republicans and Democrats before it can go uh, back for another vote. So in this particular time, if you can't get people to agree, you're pretty much going to lose your bill. Oh, wow. uh, a lot of negotiations going on, a lot of people running up downstairs and, and trying to get meetings set up. And it's hard. Um, I think yesterday somebody told me there was more than 15 conference committees yesterday. Well, there's only a few conference rooms, so you got a scheduling issue, and uh, and so but uh, they're going to get done. They always do. Right. So when people go online and actually try to watch things yep. in in their committees, sometimes you won't be where they think you should be, but that's because you're in another meeting. That, well, that's right, Debbie. The, uh, someone mentioned to me this week, hey, I saw a video of the House chamber and you weren't in your seat. Well, uh, it's probably in conference committee because conference committees take place while session is happening. Right. And so uh, that that's uh, a big part of it. Uh, that we have to leave the House chamber, our Senate chamber as it might be, go to the conference committee, get a report, and then that report has to be circulated. It has to go through all four caucuses in the caucus, not just the author or not just the sponsor, but the caucus has to say, yeah, that's good public policy. Right. If they say, no, we're not going to let you sign it, you don't, you, your bill dies. Mm. So you got to find language that is one, good public policy, and two, you can get an agreement on that it uh, needs to move forward. It's, there's a skill to it, uh, and it does take a lot of time as well. Well, you all seem to be working pretty well together this year. Well, we try. <laughs> yeah. So there is a bill, a Senate Bill 132, it's public safety. How is that going to affect mm. what's going on there? Senate Bill 132 has a provision in it that deals with the Department of Homeland Security. That's m most of the bill is their own uh, agency bill. But 132 has a uh, amendment in it that was put in in the conference committee that says that the Indiana Department of Homeland Security will know where all the school resource officers are across the state. Oh. Now, that is uh, for accountability, so we know who has them and how many, but it will not be public knowledge. It will not be public information just for Homeland Security. Uh, those uh, uh, school resource officers are paid in part by a grant from Homeland Security, so they want to know how many there are out there. Um, that bill will be... Uh, uh, in, it was in conference committee on yesterday. It'll be discussed in caucuses on Monday, and it's got a good chance to get out Monday afternoon, uh, if not to get out Tuesday, probably. There's, it's not controversial, just uh, something that was added. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on to the next bill we're going to yeah. talk about, and that is Senate Bill 235. It's uh -huh. PMOC is the actual yeah, that, abbreviation for it. That's an acronym. An acronym. So, uh, so what it does, Debbie, is this bill uh, establishes best practices for firefighters. Mm -hmm. We talked about it a couple weeks ago, but what it does is it says that the state of Indiana must develop what they would call best practices of how to make uh, someone in the fire service life better or safer or healthier. And once that's established, then those best practices will be distributed to the fire departments, both career and volunteer, and then those individuals will um, put it into place. Well, when a bill came over from the Senate, it had a provision in it that said you can get a discount rate on your uh, workman's comp insurance if you adopt best practices, and also your pension 
rate for the state perf pension. That's awesome. But what happens is um, this bill did not go through PMOC. Right. And PMOC is the Pension Management Oversight Commission. And so PMOC's job is to oversee the health of the pension. And you don't want that pension becoming uh, insolvent. And so that's P PMUC's job. And so we didn't take this through there. Now we believed it would be a positive, not a negative, but we couldn't be sure. And so that portion has been taken out in conference committee, but the portion allowing you to get a discount rate for your workman's comp is still there. Mm -hmm. And so that will make the bill uh, move forward without any problem. It's not a controversial bill at all. Um, but it's not that big of distraction or detraction from the bill because um, the bill won't go into effect until July 1. Right. It'll take the state a while to develop those best practices. It'll take a while once they're developed and offered for the departments to put them in place. And only then will they be able to go to their insurance carrier or the pension and say, We've implemented these best practices. Now you should give us a better rate. Our people are healthier. Our people are safer. So we'll be back next year, and PMOC can look at this this summer. And then next year, if they're good with it, we'll put that provision right. in, and it'll become law and uh, probably won't have little to no effect at all to the bill. Well, the more eyes you have on something, the more likely you're going to cover the things that could go wrong. Well, that's right, Debbie. And, and you want to make sure that we do protect the pension. Right. And the PMOC's just doing their job. And uh, so uh, we took it out of the bill. It wasn't, like I say, wasn't any controversy to it. Uh, but we'll probably put it back in once PMUC looks at it. Right. Give them a chance to do their job. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Now, you've got a couple of surveys you've been doing. I have. And I'm going to read one of the survey okay. questions. Let's talk a minute about what the survey does. Yes. Every household in Indiana gets a survey from their legislator, right. both senator and representative. In this case, House District 67, all the households get a copy of a survey. And those survey questions are chosen from probably 200 questions, and right. there may be seven or eight on the survey. And I chose them. And uh, some of the, the questions on there had some pretty interesting responses. And so uh, a couple of them that I think we're going to talk about here in a minute, right. uh, uh, which came back. Now, a lot of the surveys, there's a place where you can color in. I like it. I don't like it. But then there's also a place you can write in. And so uh, for your listeners, I want you to know I read every one of those surveys. I read every one of those surveys. So I saw what you said. I understand and I, I will do everything I can to, to listen to you and try to do the best we can to get things in a better place as far as the state. Right. Well, that's great. I, I know you do. We try. Well, it, if you read what their concerns are, then you can address them later. Well, you can, Debbie, but uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, you you may pick up two surveys and have two opposite opinions. Mm -hmm. You can't make them both happy. That's right. So uh, I think the important thing is, one, to hear what the folks have to say, yes. and then two, to develop good public policy that benefits everyone, but frankly, you're not right. going to keep everybody happy. No, but when you address their issues, you can mm. address them in different ways, whether this, I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. this can't be implemented because of this, this, and this, or we can do this, but we have right. to wait for this to happen. And then some of it is is, Debbie, that uh, I get a question about what about this and what are we doing about that? And we've already fixed it or we've already done something that accomplishes what they're asking for, but they don't know. Right. And so we send letters back and I pull those letters that have specific question and my staff will draft a letter with the answers and then we'll send it to them. So try to communicate as best we can with folks. And by the way, if you're, if, if you still have a question, you can email me, you can yes. go on Facebook and find me. I'm on Facebook. Uh, send me a message on there and we will get you an answer. It may not, I can't guarantee it's going to be the answer you want, but I will get you an answer. It, it, well, a lot of people just want to be heard. They just want to know that but that's their right. somebody's listening. That's their right yes. as a citizen of the state of Indiana. Yes. They have a right to be heard by their legislator. Mm -hmm. And um, that's uh, always been my position. I do the best I can to listen. Well, that's great. So we're going to read one of the questions, and then yep. you're going to tell us about it. So one of them said, should Indiana do more to ensure every community has access to fast, reliable broadband. Yeah, well, that's a real problem, as you know, Debbie, across all the country, but right. Indiana is no, not uh, exempt. Uh, we have an issue with high-speed internet, and uh, anybody who has children knows that uh, for them to do their homework or, or to, for the, even the parents to check on the kids' grades, they right. have to have internet. And um, dial-up, you know, doesn't work. <laughs> oh, so, no. so they have to have a, a higher speed. The question then becomes, 
what can Indiana do to provide high-speed internet without becoming an internet company? I don't believe your listeners want the state of Indiana to go into the internet business. We probably run it pretty bad. And so what we have to do is we have to figure out how to get high-speed internet out there. And so what we did, and with Governor Holcomb's lead, we developed a, a, a program uh, uh, where high-speed internet co companies that provide high-speed internet can get a grant, uh, a matching grant, to come out and build high-speed internet in rural Indiana. One of the reasons that a company might not come is the return on investment on a road where there's eight people may not be sufficient right. uh, to pay off the investment. And these are private companies. And so what we did was we said, if you give half, we'll pay half, up to $100 million is in the budget to do this. And there is a good deal of uh, internet being built. Uh, most of it's fiber optic um, around our state. But we also know that's not going to be enough. That's that's the beginning. We've got a long way to go, and so. Uh, but we are working on it. We're trying to, to do everything that we can to uh, to get high speed internet out in the countryside. Yesterday, I had two pages page for me, uh, middle school kids, and both of them's biggest concern was they didn't have high speed internet. They can't effectively do their homework. No. They ca they can't uh, th when they leave school if they're off school for a couple of days. They can't uh, keep up, and so uh, it's a big issue. It's an issue for business. It's an issue for farmers. We got to get it fixed, and uh, we're working on. It. Well, that's good because on the survey, 72% said that was ne a necessity. So. Well, I think it is, and, and Debbie, if we can go back, and of course I, I am old, but I'm not this old. Back in the 1920s and the 30s, when electricity came to rural Indiana. Um, it took years to, for it to get here. Uh, people had to wait. Uh, you know, there's REMCs that are co-ops. That's how a lot of it got paid right. for. But uh, uh, we're kind of in that same scenario, but we're in such a different world. Our world's so fast-paced. People just can't wait uh, a long time right. uh, to get it. So we, we got a challenge. We got to keep working on it. But that's what we are doing with high-speed broadband. Well, that's that's good. At least you're in the right direction. So, I think so. Yeah. So the next question has to do with Narcan. Uh -huh. Now this one asked, um, should uh, treatment or support uh, for users that have been administered these reversal drugs multiple times, mm. should they have support or treatment? Well, Debbie, this is a tough question, and and of course uh, it's. Um, it's a very difficult thing to deal with. It is. Addiction is um, on the rise, evidently, and, and it's, a, it's a tragedy when a family has to deal with a, right. an addiction. Um, so what we were trying to establish, Debbie, was if someone has this drug, and Narcan, if your viewers aren't familiar with it, Narcan is a drug that reverses the effects of an opioid, yes. like a heroin, like morphine, and it reverses it. So someone's overdosed, they are going to die unless they receive this drug, Narcan, which blocks the ability of the drug yes. to, to suppress their respiratory rate and to kill them. The, thing, the question is, who should pay for it? Well, I, I agree. That's taxpayers, the support side of it. Right. Yeah. Taxpayers should, should have a right to have that money reimbursed. Right. And uh, there is a valid argument if you can afford to buy the drug, you can afford to buy the Narcan. Um, so the first thing I would say is, yes, we definitely want to be reimbursed as a community, uh, fire department, police department, EMS unit for the drug. That's not free. The second thing is, should someone who is using this and overdose more than once be uh, required to go through drug treatment? And that is, uh, as you said, 92% of the people took that survey believe that to be the case, right. as do I. So uh, the question is a little further, a little deeper, however. On the survey, uh, there's a yes or no box, but at the bottom, there's an area the for comments. comments. And I heard a lot of comments. A lot of them were similar to this, and I just want to explain to your uh, viewers w what I'm uh, about to describe. So someone is overdosed on a, on a, a narcotic, and they are in jeopardy of dying. They will die without treatment. So some folks have said that if someone overdoses more than twice, they shouldn't receive Narcan. They should simply be allowed to pass away. First off, I disagree with that uh, 
as a firefighter, as a paramedic, I uh, took a Hippocratic oath to provide the medical care for those who need it, and they need it. They're going to die without it. I cannot envision myself standing beside someone whose life I could save and not doing it on purpose. So what I would say is that I get it. You're frustrated. You're tired of paying for the Narcan. You're tired of paying for the, the addicts. And they are addicted to these drugs. There's no question the drug is driving their life. But what I would say is they have no life if we don't give them the Narcan. That's why I believe it's appropriate that they pay for it. I believe it's appropriate that they go for drug treatment and then monitoring and accountability. Yes. But I would never not give it to them if I could save their life. That is someone's son, daughter, father, mother, sister, brother, aunt, uncle. Someone loves that person dearly. I heard it said recently by someone that very thing. If they get Narcan more than twice, that's it. They don't get it again. And a lady was standing there whose son uh, was a, uh, addicted to narcotics. And she started to cry. And she said, thank you so much. My son has had Narcan five times, but he's still with us. He still has a chance. If you let him die, there is no chance. Uh, right. that, that's, uh, that's something I can't do. I would not support. But I do think there should be accountability. And I think that, uh, that they should pay for the drug. If they can afford the, the, the heroin or whatever they're taking, they can afford the Narcan. Right. And so uh, I, would, I would support that. But uh, certainly I would never withhold the life-saving drug that I had if I had it. Well, I think that's something, you know, if, if they are held accountable and they do have to pay for the drug mm -hmm. and they have to actually go for treatment, mm -hmm. that's another step to put them on the right path. Well, that's right. I mean, we don't want them to overdose again and right. again. We know eventually they'll overdose where there's nobody around. Nobody will give them Narcan right. and they will pass away. But in a lot of cases, these are young people whose life is all ahead of them. They just got to get a handle on this. They got to get it under control. And uh, addiction's evil. Um, uh, drugs that are uh, controlling someone like these narcotics, they're in charge of their life. If, yeah. if they don't get control of it, get on the, the proper treatment path and, and stay on it, uh, that drug will take control again, and they'll be right back where they are. So, uh, it's a it's a very difficult thing. Uh, it's sad. It, it's heartbreaking, and I know it hurts a lot of families. I can't imagine the mothers or the fathers, uh, or, or the children for that matter, who Have cry and worry it. about their parents because right. they know that they're uh, in danger of, of passing away from overdose. Right. Well. Hopefully that'll all go through and, and it'll help a lot of people. That will be a good one. Well, let's hope so. Uh, we're we're going to continue to work on it. Uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, not this session, but, Next. you know, Debbie, during the summer, we continue to work on legislation yes. and we continue to have hearings and listen to people. And as well as when I'm out in the community, I always uh, look forward to hearing from folks, whether, you know, we're always trying to be out and about. So if you see me and you got an issue, a question, just ask. Uh, if you don't see me and you have a question you want to ask, go to my Facebook page right. or you can go to my internet or my email for the State House. It's online and send me a message and then we'll respond. Great, great. Yeah. I'm sure they'll do that. So. I hope so. Now, next week, what kind of a session are you looking at for next well, week? We just have about four days left. Uh, we could finish on Wednesday. We don't have to go to the last day. And so um, it depends on who you talk to. Um, of course, leadership is saying we're going to be done on Tuesday because they want you to hurry up and get your stuff done. Right. I suspect I suspect we'll be done on Wednesday. That's, well, that's just a guess. So we could be done Tuesday. Yeah, that's not bad. Three day week. Well, yeah, that's true. But that's the end. I mean, that's the right. end of session. And after that, uh, we'll come home. We'll live under the laws we passed uh, and go back to the communities and. Uh, Try to do the best that we can for the people back here. Right. You still have your meetings and you still are oh, in sure. the community. Yep. So you'll be out there. Yep. Well, you know, of course, if they, any of your legislators, if you've got questions or you want to talk to them, give them a call or text them or. Absolutely. Yeah, send them an email. You can uh -huh. go on the, um, the actual website. Indiana General Assembly webpage. You can click on your legislator yeah. and it'll, you'll put in your uh, address and it'll tell you who your legislator is, whether it's a senator or a representative. And then you can uh, go from there and send them a message. Well, that's awesome. Y'all remember that. And we really appreciate our sponsors that make all this possible. And we thank you for watching.